Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who was baptized, but his disciples, so he left Judah <coughs> and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had gone, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? For his disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, If you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman, how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. But Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God who asked that you, who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw, with the, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons <clears throat> and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. You may be seated. May God bless us in the understanding and the reading of his word this morning. I pray that I don't knock over that bottle of water. There are many angles and ways that one could teach and preach and look at this text, especially if we include the entire story of the Samaritan woman. But this morning, I want us to simply consider for a few moments two questions and then conclude with a third question. They rise up from this text and become the place, and let it become the place of personal and corporate reflection for our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. The two questions are simply this. What compels you to do what you do? What compels you to do what you do? And then the second one is, do you really know God's gift? And then finally, I'll wrap it up with the question, what are you asking Jesus for in these days? Let's begin. What compels you to do what you do? In verse 4, John describes Jesus traveling from Judea to Galilee with these words. He had to go through Samaria. Why did Jesus have to go through Samaria? What compelled Jesus for him to go that way? Yes, and many of us would do this. It was the shortest way back to Galilee. And we're always looking for shortcuts, aren't we? But it was also the way that was less traveled. And any good, respecting Jewish person would have traveled the longer route because Jews did not want anything to do with Samaritans. Yet John tells us in four short words, he had to go. He had to go. What John is declaring in the simple phrase is that Jesus did not have a choice. There's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of great need. There was a sense where Jesus is compelled 
And a little later on in John's Gospel, just the next chapter, we hear John quoting Jesus when he says, The Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing. So what did Jesus see God doing in this moment in which John's Gospel declares or reveals the first Gentile engagement. The reality is, is these words lead us to other questions like, why Sychar? Why Jacob's well? Questions that could easily become the framework for a whole nother series of messages. But to understand why he had to go there, we really might need to go back to the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, we discover a place called Shechem. Shechem is eventually renamed Sychar. And the reason we go back to the first book of the Bible. The story begins in Genesis chapter 12, where Abram builds an altar to God because the Lord appears to him in Shechem and says to your offspring, I will give you this land. God offers Abram a promise. And so our first encounter with Shechem in Scripture is that it becomes a place of worship, a place that is celebrated where God appears and his presence is there. But fast forward to Genesis 34. We're introduced to Jacob, Abraham's grandson, and Jacob's only daughter, Dinah, or Dina. One day when Dinah was visiting the women of the land, we read the story where Shechem, not the city, but Shechem, the man who was the son of Hamor, saw Dinah. He took her, he raped her, and declared to his father, get me this girl to be my wife. When Jacob heard that his daughter, Dina, had been defiled, Genesis 34 tells us, in Genesis 34, we're told that he was silent and did nothing. And you know what? We never hear Dina's voice in all of this. His brother, Her brothers, though, develop an elaborate plan to bring revenge upon the city of Shechem, eventually killing every living male, including Shechem and his father. In just two generations, Shechem changes. In the next chap- very next chapter, we read the story of Jacob trying to bury his idols in the city of Shechem. Jump to Genesis 37, and we discover that Shechem is the place in the story where Joseph's eventual slavery begins. Fast forward to Judges 9, and we discover the torturous reign of King Abimelech. And in 1 Kings 12, the evil king Rehoboam is coronated as king. What started out as a place of worship to the one true God became a place of all kinds of sin, violence, and evil. God did not forget and Shechem needed to be redeemed. Could this be the reason why Jesus had to go to Sychar, formerly Shechem? Is this the reason why he had to go to Jacob's well and speak when Jacob couldn't speak? And let the Samaritan woman speak when Dinah wasn't given a voice in the pages of Scripture? Is this what God the Father was compelling Jesus, his son, to do. What compels you 
to do what you do? What's compelled you to be so generous supporting the Malawi mission team and the projects that we'll engage in? You know, throughout Jesus' life, he models how to live life. He's always moved and touched by the injustices around him. He always has compassion for the brokenhearted, the hurting, the marginalized, the outcasts, the people who are tossed aside in life. Jesus is compelled, controlled by the Holy Spirit to usher in and to demonstrate the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Is that what compels you? Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that, that one died for all, and therefore all have died. Are you compelled by Christ's love in your actions and reactions to the world around you? You know, I believe that one of the reasons why this church is growing and maturing in this season is because we are indeed responding to the compelling love of Christ. You know, at one point in Paul's journey in the book of Acts, Paul declares in the 20th chapter, Paul, Luke writes in Acts 20, verse 22, and now, compelled by the Spirit, this is Paul's words, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Some translations, instead of the word compel, will use the word controlled. What I love about Paul's declaration is that he says, I am compelled, but I don't know what will happen. And that's at the heart of asking the question, what compels me? You know, so often, especially in this world, we choose to do something because we know what the result will be. But to be compelled by the Spirit implies that we do not know what the future holds. We cannot control what the future holds but we do it nonetheless. In many ways, that's the way I look at our Malawi mission trip. There's a deep sense within me, and I believe in each team member, that we are compelled by the Spirit to go. And for me personally, I'm compelled because it's part of my wife's family history with the country of Malawi for almost 100 years and also my dear friendship and connection with Martin and his family. But each one of us, I invite you after worship in the atrium. Take a moment. Ask them what compels them to go to Malawi. But in the midst of being our, our, our desire to be in Malawi, I keep reminding the team that we need to lay aside our Western preconceived ideas and notions about what control looks like and what impact we will truly have. But know this, being compelled by the Spirit frees me. Being compelled by the Spirit frees me because then I don't have to worry about the results. So how would you describe what's compelling you these days? Question number two. Do you really know God's gift? In verse 10 of our lesson this morning, Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, if you only knew the gift of God, who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
if you only knew. Brothers and sisters in Christ who are gathered in this room, who are listening to this message, how well do you know God's gift? How well do you know Jesus Christ as the living water of your life? For those of you who are here or listening that have not received Christ into their lives and are following him, do you know that this gift of living water is available to you? As I mentioned earlier, we've already released the funds to dig the borehole at the Zampezi Evangelical Church in Longway, Malawi to provide fresh water from the depths of the ground to the church people in the surrounding community. Pastor Cherry told Barn that he was overjoyed at the news because it would save him from regularly having to walk down the road to the local mosque to get water. But since that water will now be on the property of the church through this borehole and well, it will also become a place where people can come and experience the living water of Jesus Christ. You know what thrills my heart right now? Even though the world I come from is so radically different from the world and the reality of the people of Malawi, there is one thing every follower of Christ in this room and every believer in Malawi has in common. And that's the living water of Christ. That spring of life that dwells inside of each and every one of us. And what is also true is that living water of Christ is available to all regardless of where they live. What the circumstances of their lives have been. What their status is. The living water breaks down all social and ethnic barriers. So what is this living water? Jesus describes this living water as the spring of eternal life. Well, what does that mean? This I know. It has to mean, and I say, way, 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 way more than simply being a guarantee of some heavenly home in some far-off reality. To understand Jesus' words, it has to have some practical, daily, vital reality to our lives right now. You know, 38 years ago this week, Elizabeth and I were on our honeymoon. We were traveling up the coast of California from San Diego to San Francisco, when California was a whole lot different state than it is now. And on our journey, we stayed two nights in Yosemite National Park. And after a good night's sleep, we woke up and we decided it was part of our plan to go on a walk through the Redwood Forest. We had a good breakfast. We found the trail. It was only a couple of miles. We didn't need to bring water. Even though the staff at the hotel suggested that we should, we didn't need supplies. It was only a few miles. And by the way, halfway down the road, halfway down the path, there's a snack shack. We can stop there. We can fill up. We have it all planned. What we didn't have planned was getting lost on our morning walk. What we didn't have planned was our morning walk turned into an all-day adventure that left us hungrier than hungry and far less hydrated than we ever should have been. By the time we arrived back at the lodge just in time for dinner. We were young, naive, foolish, and thought we had it all under control. Let's not be naive and foolish about the living water of Christ. The living water of Christ is simply the nurturing and refreshing life-giving presence of Christ 
and the Holy Spirit in our lives. Science will tell you that the reality is, is without water, our bodies would only survive maybe three days or a little bit more. Water is vital to keeping our internal temperature balanced and our cells alive. And Christ, the living water, does the same thing. So here's a few things to ponder. The living water of Christ keeps the internal temperature of our life balanced. It keeps our lives stable. The living water of Christ keeps our spiritual cells alive. The living water of Christ is essential for our health and growth, especially for the fruit of the Holy Spirit to develop, which is the outward manifestation of the living water inside of us. The living water of Christ is our constant companion in the wilderness of life. But there's more. If we go to John chapter 7, we find Jesus talking about water again. And there he declares, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. And as the scripture has said, Out of the believer's heart shall what? Flow rivers of living water. And he writes, says, our thirst, and Jesus our, says, the satisfying of thirst is for everyone who needs it. Do you see the picture that Jesus is offering? Jesus is essentially saying that the ways of the world we will leave you parched and dry. The pace and the life of the world, apart from Jesus, will never be able to truly quench your thirst. The pursuit of riches and fame and earthly security will never be able to satisfy your deepest longings, your deepest need, and your deepest thirst. And when we bring John 4 and John 7 together, we see that Christ is the living water that nurtures and flourishes, is that nurturing and flourishing spring of eternal life for believers while also becoming a river of living water for others it's a spring for us but it's a river for others in other words the spring the living water of Christ was never ever 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 you get my point to simply be for a personal benefit it is given for to us so that the spring in us feeds us and will feeds us and needs to, and then needs to become the river of life to others because if it is not the river of life to others it will simply become a stagnant pool and dry up I truly see what we're doing as we send out a team is taking the spring of life with us individually but also corporately as the body of Christ represented here and letting it flow like a river into the hearts and the lives of the Malawan people. I want you to listen to Revelation 22 for a moment. Beginning in the first verse, the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Are you hearing John's words? as clear and crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. While the fulfillment of this vision will come with the completion of the new heavens and the earth, I believe with all my heart that we as the body of Christ, we as the church, because we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are not only to be a spring for ourselves, but we are to be a river for others. We are called to give the world a good taste of this reality. Our lives and our life together, 
the fruit and the leaves are meant for the flourishing of others and the healing of nations. As the body of Christ, we are called and challenged to bring the living water of Christ to this dry and weary world. How has the river of life, the water of Christ, been a river of life to others through your life this past week? So I want to wrap up with one last question. What are you asking Jesus for these days? There's so much more that could be said about this story about the Samaritan woman's life, about the fact that this is one of the longest conversations in all of that, that Jesus has with, with any woman in all of Scripture. But in verse 15, she says, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming and drawing water. Jesus, give me this water. Is this the cry of your heart this morning? To my brothers and sisters in Christ who need to go back to the well of Christ and experience that refreshing and life-giving spring of Jesus. Is your faith drying up? Is your hope fading? Has your river of love for God and for others become stagnant? I want to invite you as we sing this last song to come back to the well of Christ this morning and join the mission team up front. To those who may not know Christ as their personal and Savior and Lord, is this the day you invite the spring of eternal life, the presence of Christ, the refreshment of the Holy Spirit into your life? Will you confess your need and desire for Christ? But let me also warn you, When you're inviting the living water of Christ into your life, you're also inviting the compelling and controlling love of Christ to lead you like you've never been led before. And as one who has now walked this journey for over 50 years, it's worth every drop of water from the living presence.